Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Likon Siddiqui. I'm part of the architect board for 3 dn DX, uh, primarily looking after 3 dn sites. Um, well, we are going to be uh, discussing today primarily the necessarily architectural changes that are in progress, and some of them has already been done and available in 9.5, and some of them are in progress, which is going to be available in 9.6 and post 9.6 to enable uh, to ensure that the product is architecturally uh, superior and uh, all the features that we are actually planning on building can be built properly. Um, so first of all, what we are going to discuss is the semantic content modeling and driving our headless content API, what we are doing around it. And if you see, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that some of the features you will see that has be, is being already delivered partially. So we have already partially delivered this uh, in uh, 9091 with GraphQL and with 95, and we are continuously improving the feature to ensure that this is uh, this and based on the feedbacks that we get from our customers, partners, and implementers. So, what? Why are we actually changing this, right? Because Tridian has been uh, available for a long time and yeah, our customers are using it. We have happy customers, but what are the changes needed? So if you see historically, Tridian uh, was primarily used for what we call as baked HTML publishing. So we had Dreamweaver templating and other forms of templating where Tridian by itself was responsible for generating the HTML content that would be presented on a website. So that's that's the first, that, that was our initial publishing model. Then came the DXA and the DD4T based publishing where we were actually generating uh, JSON. Actually, uh, the, the DXA or the DD4T component was generating JSON, leveraging our templating mechanism, which was then available in our uh, API. And then, uh, if you were not using DXA, let's say, then what you would get out of the API are is a is a string. It's not really a properly structured JSON, so you would have to have your custom code to actually construct any object models that you wanted out of it. Uh, with the DXA model service, we actually improved that experience a bit, so you did get models out of the DXA model service. But yeah, we st you, it was still. Uh, out of the product, it was not really a core feature. So you always need a DXA on top of uh, Tridian to actually achieve that. So um, since 9.5, we have uh, enabled what we call pure data publishing. So uh, what happens in 9.5 uh, that we can publish the pure content of a component or a page into the broker uh, database, and then using the GraphQL, you can retrieve it uh, and this is a properly structured data uh, that, that comes out of the GraphQL. And uh, what, what you do have is then, then you don't need any additional templating mechanisms or any open source libraries to actually consume pure data, which actually, again, enables us to, uh, uh, to ensure that we actually can deliver uh, headless content and headless, not only headless, but headless in a manner which is platform agnostic or delivery agnostic, right? It's not HTML, which is tied to a web application. So it's pure data and it's up to the representation, how you represent it. Are you putting it on a, on, on a mobile app or are you putting it up on something else? That's completely up to you because you now have the pure data. So what is the benefit? So we already had uh, DXA and DD4T, but by moving this, what are we actually benefiting? What are the benefits that this specific feature out of the box has uh, gives you? Right. So the first thing, as I mentioned, that it actually gives you the ability to do semantic content modeling. So in a 9.5, we already have ability to actually create uh, the the GraphQL API to deliver specific uh, objects or domain models, which is not let's say 3 and component or 3 and page, but it's more for the end user business like, hey, okay, some customers, they have an article or they have a blog, so it's a more strongly typed modeling that you actually get out of it. Uh, and then, uh, by the so we are also in 9.6, we are improving that experience. So in 9.6, what we are doing is we will be driving that semantic content model structure automatically based on the schema definition. So you don't actually have to have custom code which creates that model or defines that model. 
Then we also allow out of the box search capabilities, um, reducing uh, the total cost of ownership, right? So uh, again, uh, not having additional third party components or open source components actually responsible for that transformation, you can actually uh, uh, reduce the total cost of ownerships because yeah, you have uh, issues, support loads and whatever that actually then is no longer connected to those uh, third party components. Um, now, also by uh, ensuring that you are uh, uh, so you are on a pure data model, so you are not really publishing, which is you are not publishing uh, data which is really tied to a web application. You can actually enjoy a shorter time to market. So you you don't have to have a lot of content freezes when you are uh, uh, when you are publishing or when when the web application is being changed. Because right now the web app and the data are there they are disconnected. So you have pure data. And how you represent that in your web application, it's completely up to the web application builder. So the, the two streams are now separate, and then they can be managed and released separately. And also, as I mentioned, that you don't have to apply templates anymore, which essentially uh, means that the publishing actually becomes faster. Now, what we have done is this data publishing, as I mentioned, this is uh, this is an enabler for our 3D and site search, so the out-of-the-box search capability, and it's also the enabler for our semantic content modeling. So the semantic content modeling, which is the, the, re the evolution of the DXA model service, as I mentioned. In 9.5, we can already do this, but in 9.6, what we will allow is uh, that you don't actually have to have any code or any configuration. The whole content modeling is going to be driven by the schema that is defined on the content manager. So if you make a change on the schema, that content model automatically gets uh, available once published that, that, uh, that is available on the GraphQL as strongly typed semantic models. So what we are planning on doing after. so. So 9.6, we have already discussed. It's uh, what we are, what we know. But post 9.6, what we are actually going to be working on, we are uh, based on customer feedback. What we found out that when you are using a component on a page, sometimes you need some contextual metadata. Uh, and uh, yeah, so currently, a lot of our customers might be using MVC applications, so they might need information about views. They might need information about controller or some contextual information regarding that component. So historically, we have been doing that by using templates, right? So templates then actually mutate the data, but we don't want that mutation because mutating a component for a page means that every time you are using that component in different places with different templates, they need to be re-rendered, right? So then again, you are increasing your publish time. You are actually increasing the amount of volume that is going to be published. So what uh, the, the plan and the intent is that we will keep that component as pure immutable data, which gets published. But alongside that component, in context of a page, you will get some additional metadata. That's not really part of, that's not the state of the component itself. It's separate. And so when you, read, when you are reading a page, when you are requesting a page from the GraphQL API, you say, hey, these are the components. And by the way, for this component, you have this contextual metadata that can then you can drive uh, your web application or any other thing based on that contextual metadata. And uh, so if you, if you have different um, delivery channels like for web, you can use that for mobile apps. You will probably not use that contextual metadata. But yeah, again, the benefit, we will never be so any change to the uh, the contextual metadata does not impact the data in the component and vice versa. Any change to the component data does not impact the contextual metadata, which means that when you change the component itself, you only need to republish the component, not the contextual or not the page itself. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's very interesting. Then uh, what we are also going to, because as I mentioned, the, the components are now immutable, you, the, the templates are not really mutating the data. So component presentation does not mean that, uh, uh, so when you, look at, when you look at components, they are always the same regardless of where it was being used, right? So was it being used on a page or was it being used as a, as a separate item? or which page was it. So it's always that same component. So when you actually publish something or make a change to that component, you only need to republish that single component, not the containers where this was contained in. 
This will also allow us to predict the publish timing. And then we will also be doing further work on uh, trying to minimize the, the, or optimize publishing by tree shaking, by ensuring that, okay, if an item has already been published, we will not include that. And again, that is that is only possible because now we are ensuring that the templates are not really mutating data. So we know if an if a component is published, what is exactly published, right? Because historically, templates could actually change data. So if you publish the same component using the same template n number of times, the, the output could have been different because the template, for example, might have put in a timestamp. So if you publish it n times or render it n times, you will get different different uh, data. So be, because we had templates, we were not able to predict this, and we will we were not able to concretely say that okay, the the version of a component did not change, the version of a template did not change. Hence, I don't need to republish it. But yeah, now as because we are ensuring that uh, the the data is immutable, we can now say with guarantee that if the component's version did not change. It doesn't matter when you publish it or where you, uh, or how many times you publish it, it's going to be always the same output. Now, <clears throat> going on, uh, I think uh, we are, uh, what we have done with uh, 3D and Sites 9.1 already was our connector framework. However, the connector framework was very focused on uh, replacing our existing ECL connectors, right? But that's only to leverage the, the multimedia content that lives outside of Tridian and using that in Tridian. Uh, but yeah, that, that cold connector framework actually was just the foundation work for us to leverage connectors in other uh, systems as well, in other part of our systems as well. And now we are coming with the second iteration of it where we are using that same connector framework to extend our keywords or our taxonomy. So now you can actually use the connector framework to, to leverage uh, external taxonomy systems. And I think we will have talks where we go into details about how we are incorporating pool party to ensure uh, uh, to actually leverage that. Um, so again, the whole integration framework, it's very, uh, it's, it's agnostic, which means that you can actually build connectors both in Java and C Sharp and actually deploy them both on the CM side and on the UDP side. Uh, and then, yeah, we also have the add-on service to actually leverage all of those or manage all of those add-ons that you are deploying to, yeah, to make it easier. If we look at, uh, again, quick look at uh, our integration framework, what you can see here is uh, uh, the, the, the 3DN integration framework itself and then all the connectors connecting to the external system. However, on the top part, this is where we will start using the integration framework more, right? So we have, we used to only uh, use the, the multimedia components, right? So external multimedia components using ECL. Now we are using the taxonomy systems and the intent is that we are gonna, we are gonna be moving to more and more leveraging this integration framework and connectors to, uh, uh, to actually integrate different parts of the data. And yeah, the, the, we have intent of actually, let's say, in, incorporating segments, statistics, and, and, uh, and other information into the Tridian system using the same integration framework. So if you look at this, um, so this is just a screenshot of our new UI. And what you can see here is uh, an experience where uh, if you see on the, on, the, on the left tree node, we have a node called pool party. And that explicit node is coming from an external system. And once we expand that, we can actually see the different uh, uh, keywords and categories that we are represent we get from the external system. So we have something called an apertif and digestives, and we can see all the uh, all the keywords that are coming from that external system. And uh, using pool party, I think we we have detailed session deep diving into that. Uh, where Rajesh is going to go into more details on it. But yeah, we are going to be leveraging uh, more capabilities out of those external taxonomy systems, like uh, automatic tagging, suggestions, and and all of those things. Now. Uh, I think uh, with 9.5, when we introduced our new UI, we have uh, we have already 
released uh, our core service REST, which is a non-public API as of right now, at least in 9.5. We are working hard to actually make sure that we can make the API public as soon as possible. Um, and uh, But yeah, so there are some, some challenges because what we want to make sure is that once the API is made public, it is properly versioned and we can actually maintain it for a longer term and then yeah, any changes, any, prod, any integration built on the core service REST is as stable as our previous integration has been. So that's why it's not public yet, but we are working on making it public. Uh, but what is the what is the benefit? What are we actually focusing on, right? So we are ensuring by moving into a REST service, it's a lot more usable, right? By usable, uh, one of the uh, best thing is that it's a much more uh, technology agnostic uh, service, right? If you look at a uh, WCF service, uh, theoretically, yeah, a lot of the uh, platforms can actually consume them, but we have seen a lot of issues like, okay, with uh, with different security models, with different models, it's it's difficult, right? So how does how does a, a specific language platform actually talk to a uh, service? It's it's very difficult. So the first benefit of this HTTP REST API is usability, right? So you, you can now actually build integration in pretty much any language be it Node.js, be it C-sharp, be it uh, Java, it doesn't really matter, but it is it, it becomes more usable. It's also based on a, a standardized open API specification. So we are also including a UI, right? So it, let's say, I think traditionally named uh, as Swagger UI. So the, the Swagger UI is also gonna be available for you to actually look into the API. It's gonna be self-descriptive. You can actually see the parameters and, and, and yeah, kind of a documentation based uh, uh, yeah documentation replacement you can think of and uh, one crucial thing is this API is gonna only support token based authentication now token based authentication does not necessarily mean that we are not going to support uh, LDAP or let's say Windows or XAML or any other things um, sorry they are supported but not directly on the api itself right so uh, with 9.5 with our access management uh, what uh, uh, what the access management will allow us to do essentially is you can use ldap or any other uh, form of ident uh, authentication but once authenticated access management gives us a better token and that's what we use to authenticate with this api then right so in if you're if you're writing a core service client uh, usually what you do is you set a username and password on the, as a property on the client and then you just call a service and it works. However, with token-based authentication, it's always a two-step process. It's not a direct process. So you first talk to the token service. Uh, we, we have similar mechanism in DXD as well, right? So you talk to the, the token service, you get a token, and then using that token, then you talk to the service. So that's the only form of authentication that we are going to be supporting. Uh, and that's also uh, that also ensures, allows us uh, to ensure that this API is forward compatible and all the things that we want to do in the future can work with that. For example, when we are talking about running this API in a non-Windows platform, that's one of the core things that we need to ensure that it's a bare token-based authentication, right? So then you don't, you don't, you're not relying on either Windows username password or any other things uh, directly on the API itself. And finally, what you have is one API to rule them all. Because yeah, historically, what all every time when you look at our core service, uh, WCF core service, you have WCF core service, then you have a separate API for uh, ECL, you have a separate API for different components. However, with the core service rest, that's all going away. It's gonna be a single API. When you read an item, the core service REST actually aggregates everything for you and returns it in a way so that you don't have to go to different APIs. So for example, here is a, a very sample response of the API where we are getting a list of categories, right? So the same example when we were on the, uh, on the screenshot that we saw for the, for the taxonomy system where we, because when you look at the tree nodes, we first get the list of categories here. You can actually see that the first one is an internal category. It has a TCM URI. However, the second one is actually an external category. It's coming from an external system and it has an ECL URI. And all of these things are very transparent to the API and the end user. So the, so, so the end user, when it gets an ID, you can actually go to the API with that same ID 
on the same endpoint to do a read. So you don't have to go to a different read endpoint to do read an ECL item versus a TCM item. So the core service rest is going to be a single endpoint which caters for all the all the different systems and all the different subsystems that we have, and that's what it's going to come back. Um, Part of 9.6, as you see, that this is already going to happen. So um, uh, in, in 9.6, the, the, the taxonomy, the, uh, the uh, ECL for the external, meta, the external multimedia items are going to be there. And along with that, uh, we are now working on also integrating the Translation Manager API into the uh, core service REST. So as I mentioned, it's a one API to rule them all. It's probably not going to be... so upon the first public release we will probably not have all the capabilities but whatever we are going to be building it's always going to be adding on top of it right so be it, uh, be it uh, translation management uh, be it um, ecl or taxonomy system so it's all going to be through a single api with a single uh, 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 methods so yeah read for uh, uh, read for translation management jobs versus read for ECL item, versus read for an external taxonomy versus a TCM item, they are all going to be the same. Now, as I was mentioning, the, the bearer token, so we have uh, released already access management. And uh, what? why did we actually do this, right? So the one thing is that there are so many identity providers. Um, we have worked, if you look at Tridian, uh, we have added support for different authentication protocols at different point in time in different services right so initially we started let's say with windows and then we added ldap so then ldap was added in some places uh, and then we added xaml but then the xaml was only added to the ui so all of these actually starts creating this fragmentation and then we can only so if there are any new protocols like okay right now open id connect is the latest hype and then if we enable open id connect on all of them then we have to go into individual services to actually enable them so what uh, uh so so if yeah this is essentially the, the the stack where it was right so we have cme and xpm which supports windows uh, ldap saml uh, core service only supports windows and ldap topology manager supports only windows uh, Windows applications like Content Porter and Template Builder only supports Windows and LDAP. It doesn't support XAML. And DXD services uses our, uh, again, a better token authentication, OAuth-based better token authentication. So, so this is this is also an you, you can see like when when each of these individual services was developed, right? So the the new DXD microservices was developed when we knew that, okay, better token is the way forward and we only added better token. We didn't add anything else. But these applications were created before, which started with Windows, so we had to keep backwards compatibility, and then we added additional support on top of it. Right. So the, the solution to this is actually our access management, which is uh, a, a technically a federation gateway or a token service. But primarily, it's a federation gateway. And what is a federation gateway? A federation gateway is responsible for uh, authenticating your identity against an external identity provider and then transforming that identity claim set into a standard which is then the same across all of the internal services. So we are standardizing internally in Tridian on OpenID Connect. So this is the, this is the only protocol that our services are going to talk. And it's not going to talk any other protocols. It's not going to be talking Windows or LDAP or any other things. It's only going to talk OpenID Connect. But then they actually talk OpenID Connect with the access management. And then access management as a federation gateway then can talk into different protocols like XAML, OpenID Connect, Windows authentication, LDAP. And then once it gets an identity token, then it transforms it into an OpenID token and then hands it back to our individual applications and services. So that this allows us, let's say, three years down the line, we have a new authentication protocol, then we only have to add it to access management. We don't have to add it to all of those individual services. So that not only reduces our cost of implementation, however, it also reduces the cost of adoption. Because right now, if you look at our product, when you actually configure LDAP, LDAP is configured across all of the services, right? So you have to make sure that the LDAP configuration or the or the XAML configuration is right in your CME 
your uh, core service so all of these different services you have to actually make sure that any changes are propagated properly if your xaml certificate changes you have to make sure that that propagates properly across your entire uh, uh, scaled out stack of cme so all of those complexities are no longer there because we have the centralized access management so your xaml configuration is in a single place if you if your certificate expires you actually go into access management change the certificate update the certificate and then automatically all of the consumers all of the Tridian applications under the hood then can actually use that without you have to going into all of those individual applications to ensure that the certificate is updated so we are uh, again uh, just uh, i think what what are we supporting we support out of the box xaml 2.0 open id connect windows authentication however windows authentication only works when access management is running in iis and LDAP authentication. Now, the, the, the last and final piece, I think uh, this is what we have been working for a long time. Um, I think a uh, while back, uh, we have, uh, I presented in, in, a, in, a, in a Tridian Developer Summit about uh, actually running Tridian on my uh, Mac. However, that was just a POC. Uh, there are multiple hurdles for us to actually have it production and then actually release it. And if you see a couple of changes that we have been doing are exactly for that, right? So as I mentioned, like the better token-based authentication, moving into these uh, uh, core service rests. So these kind of things are actually enabling us to ensure that our platform and our software can actually run in .NET Core, in .NET 6, and uh, in a platform agnostic manner. We can still run probably .NET Core and then run in on a Windows only platform, but that's not the intent. We wanna run in a platform agnostic uh, .NET Core. And hopefully by the time .NET 6 is released, we will be a bit further along. So what are the things that we see are, also, were, are still needed, right? Uh, one of the big thing is a lot of people, a lot of you have uh, uh, been using Tridian for a long time. So you will know like, okay, how to configure logging, how to do this. But that logging was based on enterprise library logging. And that's actually, we are switching to NLog for that. And that's already going to be available in the next release. So we are switching to NLog to ensure that this is not one of the blocker. Uh, all of the libraries are going to be slowly moving to .NET standard. Uh, that's something that is in progress, and yeah, it's always um, we, we we are not guarant we are, we cannot really say when all of these will be done, but this will be a rolling change, and then moving forward, it's just gonna uh, continue changing, and we are gonna slowly start moving all our libraries to .NET standard. Um, now, based uh, because we are also use consuming our core service WCF service, we are uh, in let's say our search indexer, batch processor, and workflow agent we will have to actually rewrite them to core service rest. Uh, I think from an end user perspective, there is not a lot of impact on the batch, in, batch uh, processor or the search indexer, but the, however, the workflow agent has an impact, right? Because once we switch to the core service rest, the workflow scripts that was written for the WCF, they would no longer work. So we will have a migration path for sure. We will probably have a workflow agent using the WCF service, but yeah, that's gonna be deprecated but then it needs to be rewritten using core service rest. So again, this is not happening in 9.6. These are uh, when we actually draw the line to a full .NET 6 implementation, we are aware that these are changes that will have an impact. And that's why we are sh I'm sharing them so that you know, we can at least start preparing that mindset that, okay, they would be, they, so what, what are the impacts that we are gonna have once we are there? So the workflow scripts would be need, needs to be rewritten and uh, we are still uh, uh, looking at for the publishing impact. What what are the impacts that we have? So there would be for sure some uh, uh, some templates that would not be supported uh, in that uh, mode, right? So again, there are templates that we uh, that we have deprecated for a while. Based on our deprecation policy, they would either be dropped or would be available as a deprecated form. However. When we are looking at a pure .NET Core publisher, I think a lot of those capabilities might not be available. We still don't know. We are still working on these things. So no, nothing is uh, finalized yet, but it might be very well like, for example, okay, Dreamweaver uh, templating is not available when we are using a purely .NET Core publisher, things like that. 
Um, so I think the, the C sharp and the assembly templates would uh, most likely still be available. However, the impact again is that when you have C sharp or assembly templates, they would need to be a .NET standard templates rather than .NET 4.8 templates because yeah, uh, uh, we cannot run .NET 4.8 templates in a .NET Core publisher. So there would be impacts for uh, C sharp or assembly templates where some of the uh, uh, libraries might not be available. Some of the third-party dependencies that you are using on your uh, assemblies might not be available in net standard, so that impact might be there. But yeah, so this, these are things that we know for sure that, okay, once we move, would be potentially impacted based on different customers. Some customer will have uh, no impact, some might have some impact based on uh, our uh, current uh, thought processes. Um, so again, what are the benefits, right? Moving into that, as I mentioned, the multi-platform is our core thing, right? We want to make sure that we can run 3D and uh, the, the CM side on a multi-platform, uh, reducing the TCO, moving into a microservices architecture on the CM side. Uh, and then yeah, uh, by moving into platform and microservice, we want to also enable a containerization of the CM services, which also which essentially gives us very elastic scaling capabilities on the CM side as well. So at request or at wish, we can spin up machines and spin down machines. And uh, again, if you then start connecting the dots back, a lot of the capabilities that we are building is actually enabling that, right? So the add-on service started with that because what are the customizations? So when you actually have a service, we, you have to deploy extensions, you have to deploy binaries and configurations. So those are the things that we already took out with add-on service. So now they are not really part of the platform. They are not part of the deployment. They can be consumed from an external service. So it's a centralized thing. So, so that's one. Now, the second one we are doing with access management as well, where we are also moving a bit of the uh, uh, authentication configuration out. So all of these things are, uh, are yeah, as we call them, architectural runways, right? So we are preparing this runway to ensure that this is where we can be and we can enable multi-platform microservices and containerization on the CM side. So that being said, um, yeah, I think uh, I'm done. Um, open to questions if you guys have any. Hey, thank you, Likon, for the detailed presentation. Um, there's a couple of questions. Uh, I can see it on the chat. Uh, the first question is, um, if you are using a token-based authentication, is a session expiration or logout feature of a user available? Or uh, yes. still need to or we still need to uh, use the same, uh, close the browsers to end the session? Yes, so that's a very interesting uh, uh, question, right? <laughs> so um, if you see with our new UI, you can actually log out now. So the logout is not available uh, in the in the CME, so in our old UIs, but we are adding logout capability on the new UI, and indeed you are right as because it's a better token authentication. It's not a cookie based authentication. It's it's um, it's a so we do have underlying cookies for the UI for sure. But yeah, the logout mechanism is available now based on this access management feature. Great. Great. Yeah, I think that's kind of like answered the question, but it's good to hear from you that yes, there is an interface available. Uh, there's another question came out, uh, like, and I'm not sure that it is really to you directly, but um, so they, if the workflow been uh, built in the previous versions and if they want to migrate the workflow from the um, eight to nine, is there any tool available to convert the workflow script to the .NET uh, directly? Uh, you mean like the, the, the traditional VB script workflow that yes. we had, that one? Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, sadly, we do not have that capability, right? So the VB script. So there are multiple things, right? The, if you look at it, the, the API is different. The, the syntax is different. The, the uh, there's so much difference. We don't. There are no uh, tools to actually convert a VB script workflow into a C sharp workflow script. Yeah, I think I guess so. It is a definitely not an easy thing to convert the. Maybe skip to the .NET uh, without knowing money details. Yeah. Um, I don't think I don't have any other questions being asked in the in the session. But it's a great to see that what's coming up, uh, Likan and the new architecture. I like it uh, 
very much. And especially with access management, we seen the questions from the customers that, okay, so they have multiple things, how we can authenticate and all. I think access management is a great solution. I think we have it. Yeah, so essentially what it also, there are some indirect advantages as well, right? So when you when we are using access management, what you can do is you can actually configure multiple uh, IDPs as well. So for example, you can have one which is connected to, uh, let's say, and uh, let's say your Windows authentication, but you can also use one which is coming from an external XAML authentication. So that means that uh, you can essentially use two different user sources in one go. And then once you go into the login prompt, if you see, uh, if you log in into a lot of these applications, you see, hey, do you want to use GitHub? Uh, do you want to use Microsoft Live? Do you want to use Google? So that, that those kind of options then uh, gets presented. And then you can select which specific identity provider that you want to actually uh, gain access. For example, this is also very crucial for our own cloud where in our cloud, we have our cloud operations, which is using our our identity provider, which is, let's say, Microsoft Azure based uh, Azure Active Directory. Whereas our customers have their own identity provider. It could be uh, uh, it could be Google, it could be uh, Ping Federate or some other IDPs. But uh, when you log in into CME, both of these identity providers need to be able to work together, right, simultaneously. So these kind of situations actually greatly helps as well going through access management yeah definitely i think uh, because that's uh, going to be the a lot of customers going to have their cloud environment set up as well so that will be really useful that uh, they can use any kind of authentication uh, to communicate it yeah um i don't see any further questions from that yeah so i would like to thank you very much uh Likon, on the your presentation it's great to see yep thank you so much thank you thank you everybody